Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. If you'd like to become a patron of the podcast, just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the History Network. The History Network.org podcast, season 30, episode 4, The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived or Will Ever Live, The Story of Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. This episode was written by Lieutenant Colonel Chris Alro. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Alro is a retired medical specialist and for 21 years was a medical officer in the Australian Defence Forces full and part-time. He was appointed Senior Medical Officer to 11th Brigade and later 3rd Brigade. In 2001, he was posted to Bougainville as the Officer Commanding Health Element Peacekeeping Forces on Operation Bel Issy, the UN operation to ensure the peaceful transition of the people of Bougainville to a provisional government. His next book, This Must Not Happen Again, How Government is Wasting Your Money and Ruining Your Health, is expected out soon. The title of this podcast comes from a claim made by Charles V's private secretary, Louis Quijada, about him and says something about the extraordinary devotion this monarch inspired in his people. That statement is remarkable in that most people have never either heard of this ruler or know almost nothing about him, and yet there are grounds for the claim. Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor, also known as Carlos, was born in 1500 and he lived for 58 years, dying in the Spanish monastery of Eusta of Malaria. As we list his titles, King of Spain, King of the Netherlands, Flanders and Belgium, Emperor of Austria and Hungary, ruler of much of Italy, including Milan, Sicily, Sardinia and Naples, and Emperor of the Americas, the listener is apt to think that his realm encompassed much of the known world, as indeed it did, but this did not take account of the periphery. Charles's aunt was Queen of England, one sister Queen of Portugal, later Queen of France, another Queen of Hungary and a third Queen of Denmark, and a brother was Archduke of Austria and King of Rome. Of all his titles he preferred Duke of Burgundy, because this was where he came from, though during his lifetime the duchy had ceased to exist thanks to the rash decisions of Charles the Bold his great-grandfather. Charles the Bold had hoped to turn the rich Duchy of Burgundy into a kingdom which would encompass much of France, the Netherlands and Switzerland. His father, Philip the Good, and his grandfather had interfered with, and at times conquered, much of France, which then was divided between the Burgundians and the English. Charles the Bold's father, Philip, had turned Joan of Arc over to the English to be burned in 1431. His grandfather, John the Fearless, had been regent of France when Charles the Sixth, the French king, had become insane and believed he was made of glass. John the Fearless was about to come to an arrangement to keep the English out of France with the Dauphin, the Mad King's son, when he was assassinated by a savage blow to the skull in 1419. When Francis I, a later French king, Charles V's chief rival throughout his reign, was shown the skull of John the Fearless, kept at the monastery of Blois, the monks pointed to the hole in the back of the skull and commented, through this hole the English entered France. This was the background of Charles V, whose grandmother, Mary the Rich of Burgundy, was the wealthiest woman in Europe. She married Maximilian I, Holy Roman Emperor, and Charles's grandfather. Maximilian comes down to us as a brutal head in a wonderful etching, Emperor with a Cloth Cap, by Albrecht Dürer. 
Charles's grandparents on the maternal side were Ferdinand and Isabella of Catholic Spain, that famous couple who gave us the Spanish Inquisition and Christopher Columbus. Their daughter, Joanna, married Philip the Handsome, son of Maximilian I. Their oldest son, Charles, Carlos, was born in the Netherlands. At this point in the narrative, the listener may feel that sovereignty in Europe at the time was a family project, largely consisting of one big unhappy family. This may not be far from the truth, because so many of the rulers were closely related through a system of arranged marriages. Certainly the complex web of marriages and family connections helps us understand why people like Charles V and the other great kings thought the world belonged to them. They were appointed by God and they had the right to do what they liked with it. In the first half of the 16th century, Europe and even much of Asia and the Middle East was governed by the fortunes of just four kings, Henry VIII of England, Francois I of France, Charles V, the Holy Roman Emperor, and Suleiman the Magnificent, the Ottoman Sultan. They lived and died around the same time, and the shifting pattern of alliances and wars in the first half of the 16th century was their work. Russia was not a world player then, having just extracted herself from the Mongol Khans and was about to descend into total anarchy following the death of Ivan the Terrible. The other world-changing event that was to shape the lives of these kings, and Charles especially, was the Protestant Reformation. The Catholic Pope no longer had any significant temporal power, and the Catholic Church was little more than a shop. Martin Luther released his 95 theses at the Cathedral of Wittenberg in 1517, and the world would never be the same. Luther was reacting to the attempt by Pope Leo X to raise money by selling indulgences, essentially free passes to heaven. In that year, Charles was proclaimed King of Spain after the death of Ferdinand, Isabella having died before her husband. He was to rule in conjunction with his mother Joanna, but as we shall see, she was probably insane. At the age of 21, Charles was to sit in judgment of Martin Luther at the Diet of Worms. Luther had been granted amnesty to attend, which was just as well because Charles wanted to throw him on a bonfire. Charles faced a problem. As much as he wanted to deal with Luther, he was aware that a number of the German states were sympathetic to the preacher. These were the elector states. They were called this because it was their task to elect by vote who would be the Holy Roman Emperor. Although Charles controlled the estates of his grandfather Maximilian in Austria and Germany, he had only just become emperor in 1519 and he was not yet strong enough to stare down the elector dukes, princes and bishops that ran the states of Germany, such as the Duke of Saxony and the King of Bohemia. Charles needed to consolidate his power over those electors who had embraced the Protestant faith. He could not have killed Luther after giving his word. The word of a gentleman and ruler could not be broken without loss of honour and reputation. Reference is frequently made to this in the writings of Charles. He would learn later when he broke his own rule, greatly to his cost, what a loss of honour meant when he killed some French ambassadors. Luther was allowed to leave, and a temporary agreement was forged allowing the elector princes to nominate the religion of their subjects. There are other reasons Charles remains obscure today. In a sense, he was neither fish nor fowl, a king everywhere but nowhere, who initially did not speak well any of the languages of the kingdoms he ruled, speaking French instead, which was the language of his most hated rival. The obscurity cannot be owed to a lack of documents. There are many thousands of these, many biographies, and importantly, the work of his own hand, the Advice to Philip, King of Spain, arguably a better document than Machiavelli's The Prince or the Meditations of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius. 
Carlos stares out at us from his fine portrait by Titian, but what you see is what you get. The massive figure holding the lance, wearing black armour, was, in reality, the last of the great emperor warriors in the true tradition of Caesar. He led his men into battle, suffering their privations. He was unique in all the history of warfare, where soldiers lament that their rulers do not have to fight like them. He challenged Francis I of France to a duel, in which he proposed they fight in lieu of their soldiers having to do so. He had every intention of fighting Francis. Francis backed down, and so Charles was able to accuse him of being a coward thereafter. One striking aspect of the portrait of Charles by Titian is the so-called Habsburg jaw, a hereditary elongation of the mandible that emerges in other Habsburg descendants. In Charles, it was a partial disability, and he was never able to properly close his mouth. Beside going to war, Charles and Henry VIII pursued other extremely dangerous sports, such as hunting and jousting, in which the participants often suffered serious injuries. After one tournament, Henry nearly died of a head injury and suffered a separating wound of the leg that tortured him for the rest of his life. Both injuries made him very irritable. Likewise, Charles suffered leg injuries which plagued him till he died. He was greatly exacerbated by episodes of gout that so crippled him later in life that he could only get about on a donkey. Charles was successful for several reasons. He was very cunning and had exceptionally good advisers, to whom he listened carefully. Henry VIII had a bad habit of killing advisers who told him things he did not want to hear. Charles could be truly kind, and his advisers loved him. He found women to be incredibly good rulers, and sensibly made some of them regents of parts of his empire, his wife Isabella, and later his daughter Maria in Spain, and his sister Mary in the Netherlands. In his writings he outlines the skill in picking good advisers and regents. He was an astute delegator, giving Ferdinand his brother the Habsburg lands in Austria and Germany. He did not make the mistakes of Charlemagne, his predecessor, and chose his heirs well, Philip his son in Spain and Ferdinand in Austria. Because of this, the Habsburgs were to enjoy another 400 years of rule in Austria and rule in Spain for another 200 years. He possessed another quality that the other monarchs did not, luck. In some ways, his good fortune was astonishing. In 1525, of the Battle of Pavia in Italy, King Francis, after a foolish manoeuvre, fell into the hands of the Austrians and became a prisoner of Charles. After the Battle of Capodosso in 1528 at Naples, the French had Charles's forces by the throat and were about to take the city, when suddenly Andrea Doria, the great Genoese admiral in charge of the French fleet, changed sides to Charles and the French cause was lost. In 1535, Charles sailed across to Africa and destroyed the Barbary pirate fleet led by the red-bearded pirate Barbarossa. It was a stunning blow to his hated eastern rival, Suleiman the Turkish Sultan. There is a disquieting story about Charles which illustrates the difficulties of ruling in the Middle Ages. When Ferdinand, the Spanish king, died, he left the kingdom to Joanna, his daughter, and her son Charles to rule jointly. Joanna seems to have been insane. This has been disputed, but stories of her being merely a little irrational gave way to rumours of total insanity when her husband died. She kept the body and spent the following months as she took it to Spain, cuddling and kissing the corpse. Charles had her confined to the castle of Tordesillas in Castile, where the men charged with her care were to create a fantasy world for her to live in, so that she would never find out about the situation in the real world. Charles would visit her from time to time, and when he did, would steal from her a lot of her gold jewellery and tapestries for himself. This behaviour seems odd for the ruler of such a large territory, unless you realise that these monarchs were chronically short of money, 
to run their kingdoms and conduct their wars, and there was no regular reliable method of taxation. It was the gold that Charles finally got from the Americas that financed his religious wars. We can probably dismiss the notion that Charles kept his mother confined because he did not want to share power with her in Castile. Charles had no compunction about his female relatives running parts of his empire. Clearly Joanna could not be trusted because of her mental state. Charles treated women well. Like all medieval kings, he was unfaithful, but was still devotedly loved by his wife Isabella, and their union was passionate, producing Philip, Maria and Juana. He sired four illegitimate children from affairs with a variety of women, some not noble, but still he treated these women fairly, recognised his paternity, and raised their illegitimate offspring, three daughters and a son, from his purse. The oldest, Margaret, was the product of a servant woman. Margaret rose to become the regent of the Low Countries, Holland today, and her mother was given a rich pension. Juana died young, aged seven, and the third daughter, Tadia, became a nun and later lived in Spain under the protection of Philip the Eleventh. Of the four children, it was the boy Juan who was to change the world and become one of the greatest commanders in military history. And we will learn more about him and the military exploits of Charles in part two of this podcast coming to you in a couple of weeks time if you heard a few knocks and bangs and perhaps even screams and cries uh, in the far background of the podcast during that uh, that was my seven month old son uh, who wants to get into podcasting quite keenly it would appear Uh, Hopefully that didn't interrupt your enjoyment of the podcast. You may have noticed last episode as well, we carried an advertisement for non-patrons. If you're a patron of the podcast, then you won't have had the advertisement in it. So that's one advantage of becoming a patron. Thank you all so much. Just pop along to patreon.com forward slash the history network to find out more about that. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the History Network dot org podcast, written by Lieutenant Colonel Chris Alvo, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>